Welcome to the interview series, a series of conversations centered around a vision, how we edit and reshape literary works over time. The interview series is a production of the Iowa-based arts and education nonprofit One Year Critique, Linda BC, which provides educational resources and editorial support to students and teachers of the literary arts. You can learn more about our programs and view comparative texts of interviewees' work by visiting www.onewcritique.com. That's the number one, newcritique.com. Our website also offers insight into ways of supporting current and future programming. Thanks for listening, for your donations, and for your patronage. I'm Ingrid Wenzler, here today with Julie Iromania. Before we chat about your work, Julie, and how you revised it, I'd like to introduce you, read your bio, point listeners to some of the other compelling work you've been doing. Julie Iromania is the author of Mr. and Mrs. Doctor of Coffee House Press, a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award, the Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize for Debut Fiction, the Eddie Salat Prize for Literature, and the National Book Critics Circle John Leonard Prize for Debut Fiction. Her scholarly critical work most recently appears in Meridians, Feminism, Race, Transnationalism, Kalaloo, a journal of African American arts and letters, Afropolitan literature as world literature from Bloomsbury Publishing, and the Georgia Review. She's a 2020 George A. and Eliza Gardner Howard Foundation Fellow, and she was the inaugural Herbert W. Martin Fellow in Creative Writing at the University of Dayton. Iromania earned her PhD at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. She's an assistant professor and director of undergraduate studies in the program in Creative Writing at the University of Chicago and affiliate faculty of the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality and the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. She's at work on a second novel, A Season of Life. So today we'll be discussing three versions of it between the opening of your debut novel, Mr. and Mrs. Doctor. We'll concentrate on the earliest draft you shared with me called yesterday in the first chapter of Mr. and Mrs. Doctor. But we'll also chat a little bit about a version of this content published in the Kenyan Review as a short story entitled An Arranged Honeymoon. The title of that Kenyan Review piece is so active that these pieces could all be simply summed up as being about an arranged honeymoon. For the benefit of listeners who haven't yet read this work, though, would you mind Julie just briefly touching on the basic plot points and scenes you ended up including? in the first chapter of Mr. and Mrs. Doctor. Uh, so um, Mr. and Mrs. Doctor is about a Nigerian immigrant couple in an arranged marriage. Um, and they are two people who are very different and they are like the least likely that you would expect to be in a room together, let alone a marriage. <laughs> and so, um, the, it, it, you know, I've, take, I've taken it out and done readings and I remember someone saying very early on, oh, she got catfished. <laughs> because essentially what happens is that um, Job has lied to everyone in his life and his community back home and told them that he's a successful doctor in America. And that can be further from the truth. Um, and so uh, when his wife, Ify comes to America, she discovers that and that lie begins to unravel over the course of the novel. The first chapter is essentially that initial meeting, the first time they meet, and they really start off clashing. And then from there, the things kind of like the, the stakes get higher and higher because they start off on such a wrong foot, on such a bad foot, and then they still have to proceed forward with this marriage. Um, and in some ways, they have to adjust themselves and learn how to survive together as a couple, um, especially in a, in a place that feels very alien um, in a lot of ways when they when they come to America together as a couple. Yeah, I think I think that's really well put and I mean captures some of what's going on. And I mean, it of course is um, you know more nuanced and you know even though um, Joe has sort of catfished the um, is you know that 
you start to see why Job does what he does over the course of the novel. And um, he really is a very sympathetic character as well. Um, so let's, let's start by looking at an excerpt from um, the earliest draft that you shared with me um, yesterday. So um, if you don't mind, I'll have you read a little of that. Sure. Share my screen. And before I get started, I do want to thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really excited to be part of this conversation. And it's, I think it's so important and meaningful for writers to see this kind of uh, this kind of work, the, the work in progress. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you, Julie, for being with us and for your kind words there. We're, we're so glad to have you. And where would you like me to read to? Um, if you could read to "When Would the Light Return?" So okay, that full first page. That would be great. Okay. Everything Job Igwelu knew about sex, he learned from American pornography. So on their first unchaperoned visit, Joe brushed his new wife, splitting her thin body against the papered wall of their lavish honeymoon suite at the Presidential Hotel in Patakwit. He tore the laced pink panties and only released his lips from her face to haltingly shout, you are the dirty slut girl. <laughs> if he punched his gut with the sharp heel of her sandal, he crumpled. They landed, the two, in a tangled heap, legs splayed in every direction. You are ugly, she insisted. Eh? And now I married a beast. I married a beast. Hey! She wound up her fists and struck him squarely on her ear. And then just like that, the lights flickered and went out, leaving them in darkness, like the first time they met. On that first visit, Job's face had been nothing more than a jagged relief etched on the dark. In the living room of Epi's auntie and uncle, Job had leaned on the edge of a seat, gulped in the darkness in big breaths. Even in the darkness, Epi was not fooled. Potato sack head, stout shoulders, hog's gut, bushy curling eyebrows, thick glasses pushed into the lips of his nose. She could not make out the lighting of his face, but streaks of sweat glowed on the kerosene lamp, casting his features in helpless disarray. When would the light return? Lovely, thanks so much for reading that. It was so beautifully. Um, some of what I love across these drafts is um, just how much you're priming us for what's to come in terms of Job's identity in particular, that even down to his appearance, uh, you know, his, his features are in disarray here. In another place, you have them um, sort of surrendering to his surroundings. And that's really beautiful to see across drafts. And I mean, actually reading this the first time, ended up thinking of him as a little bit like a cubist painting. Yeah, um, these thoughts of paintings aside, um, what can you tell us, Julie, about how yesterday originated? What gave you the idea to write about Job and Ify at all and their honeymoon in particular? So this is, I guess, the, the, it began as my dissertation. So I did a, a, a PhD in English with a creative dissertation. So I knew I wanted to write a novel that explored the experience of uh, Nigerian immigrants in America. Um, this character Job had been had been around for a long time for me. I'd written about him first, I think, at that point, maybe ten years or so before, as like a character sketch. And he was like really a composite character that represented different kinds of bachelor family friends that he had, um, who had been in America for a long time but didn't really identify themselves as America. Felt very strongly identified as Nigerian. And I thought that that was a sort of an interesting kind of duality in their experience of um, being very insistent on, on their identity in one way, but facing um, facing all kinds of different circumstances in the other way. So I was really interested in that. Um, and I visited family in Nigeria. Um, and when I spent time there, you know, I really, really, uh, one of my aunt's house girls was really, really beautiful, smart young lady. And I, beca I became very aware of how in her situation, an advantageous marriage might be one of the only ways that she could potentially um, move up the economic ladder. Um, and so like the wheel started turning at that point. But I think like the thing that, <laughs> that crystallized this whole thing was I was set up on a lot of blind dates. <laughs> I had like all these aunts and uncles who were like, 
you know, pushing these different men toward me and um, not like many that I felt were very compatible. Like we just weren't ma matched, you know? So uh, I, I thought that there was something interesting in this idea of these two people being set up in this marriage that was supposed to be advantageous to both of them. Um, and so when I, I, you know, that was my initial idea. And when I submitted it for a workshop, I actually got a lot of feedback that was like, um, the responses were like, you know, well, he's this terrible guy and, you know, they didn't, she didn't have any agency, you know, that was how it was being read that, that she didn't want to be there. And, and so um, when I decided to expand it into a novel, that was one of the, one of the steps I, I, I felt I need to create. Um, I need to explore Job's ex experience more for us to understand why he does what he does. Um, even if it becomes a source of conflict at certain points in the, in the story. And then for Ify, I needed to, to do more to reinforce her agency in that relationship that she wants to be there and there are things that she's she intends to get from it as well yeah i'm so i'm so glad to hear that it's, i mean I, I think that does happen um in the novel and you know i i think it reads a lot like um a traditional tragedy in that way mm -hmm. um i i really come to understand job and um you know i don't I think it's one of those things where there are times where he makes mistakes and you know you sigh as a reader almost watching him do what he does so you can see how it's going to turn out poorly for him um, but at the same time understanding so well where he comes from um, you know you almost pity him or at least feel compassion for him and, um, if you likewise, um, I don't see her as without agency at all. I see her as you know very strong and with interests um, her own, and um, there does at times that at times there is this tenderness between them. Um, so I mean, you do sort of in places as a reader, I find I root for the two of them for all their problems um, as individuals and as a couple. Um, I'm curious, did you always envision this as a longer work or did it? No, actually it was, I think it, originally it was just a short story and it was, mm -hmm. and you can kind of see how it's set up structurally um, and that changed, um, you know, in later drafts, but initially the idea was, um, so there are a lot of uh, electricity shortages in Nigeria that are constantly happening. And like, mm -hmm. you know, when you think about how, how really how that affects your day that was something that was I was really thinking and it was like my first trip to Nigeria and just thinking about how your life has to pause for a moment especially like if you don't have a generator right because if you have a generator that's fine it'll come on um, and if you have fuel for your generator fine but um but how just normal everyday things you're doing washing the dishes doing homework with your kids watching tv like having company over and sitting on the couch whatever it is um, that that thing interrupts your moment, and everyone stops, and everyone shouts "Nefa," you know, um, which is the name of the company um, resp responsible for electricity. So I was interested in thinking about this as a, a short story with a very like determined frame. Mm -hmm. um, and when I submitted it to workshop, some people got it, and some people did it. And I think some of that is the cultural stuff that mm -hmm. um, we. I think you have to just ex ex accept that um there's some things that your readers just don't know or won't or won't understand like if you're not familiar with uh issues with electricity shortages in other countries if you are then you get it right away and some people did but some people didn't but also i felt um in the discussions that the interruptions because it happens throughout the entire the yesterday version um what it did was it really chopped up the story and mm -hmm. And you know that was part of my initial intent because I wanted it to feel like this interruption that kept happening. So like I wanted to build up this momentum because the momentum is all supposed to this velocity is supposed to be building towards the two of them and copulating, right? Because that's the thing that signifies their marriage. Um, it's revealed later that they actually had her his his brother stood in for him in the wedding too. So this is the moment where they're this is the thing that will make their marriage feel real for them. It's a it's a step that they both have to take. 
but I wanted to create all these forces to prevent that from happening. And that there'd be this velocity building toward that, but the interruptions would sort of hasten that demand. Um, but I think what it ended up doing was it chopped it up so much that it made it um, difficult to develop the, some of the deeper layers of their relationship and their connection and them as individuals. Um, and so when I revised it, then I thought about keeping some of those in, but not as many. Wow, that's, that's really fascinating. Um, I did notice that choppiness um, and the way that like certain sections sort of hinge on one another, um, mm -hmm. but I wasn't, I admit, um, connecting that with the power outages directly and that creating that feeling. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I can see why um, that would be really interesting to play with. Um, and I'm so glad you shared that. Um, mm -hmm. But also why you might um, want to soften mm -hmm. some of those those outages, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and it's like it's one of those things where it's like you're filled with impatience, right? Because you're in the middle of something. Maybe you and your family are playing a board game or something, mm -hmm. and then the lights go out and it's pitch black, and you want to make the next move and you can't, right? So that kind of impatience was what I was going for. But I don't think that I don't think you want your readers to be impatient. So you know. <laughs> So that's something to think about too. Some things in real life are probably don't quite work quite as well in, in uh, fiction. Yeah, I, I think that impatience does come across in later drafts too, in terms of your character's experiences. Um, you know, I mean, when Job shares um, his magazine, his pornography <laughs> magazine, or the, the, um, she's impatient to find out what happens because it's so new to her and, mm -hmm. um, you know, confusing and she's trying to orient herself. Um, but I so agree. I had an undergrad professor who used to talk about um, what she called the imitative fallacy. And um, oh. if you're writing about boredom, not wanting your readers to feel that boredom. Right, exactly. <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, so let's, um, let's kind of look at the later draft um, okay. from your book and excerpt of that. I will share my screen again. So if you could read just that first page, that would be lovely. Everything Job Obwanaya knew about sex, he learned from American pornography. So on their first unchaperoned meeting, Job rushed his new wife, splitting her thin body against the papered wall of their lavish honeymoon suite at the presidential hotel in Port Harcourt, Nigeria. Job tore at her lacy pink panties and only released his lips from her face to haltingly shout, you are the dirty slut girl. If he punched his gut with a sharp heel of her sandal, he crumpled. Together they landed on the floor in a tangled heap, legs splayed in every direction. You are ugly, she said, glaring at him. Potato sack head, stout shoulders, hog's gut, bushy curling eyebrows, thick glasses pushed into the lips of his nose. Eh, and now a beast. I married a beast. Hey, she wound up her fist and struck him squarely on an ear. Job clutched his throbbing ear. For a moment, he struggled to unwind the underwear from his wrist before handing them back to her. When Evie attempted to put them on, the ripped elastic band left the underwear lopsided on her hips. You see what you have done all. She thought of the time and care she and Auntie had put into her appearance for this day, the matching underwear set, the hours cooking her hair and an egg smelling the laxer, and then curling it. Her lipstick and eyeliner were now a, streak, a streaky veneer finish on her face. A solid fist banged to the door. Ify disappeared into the bathroom, clutching at the panties. When Job opened the door, a man in a too tight suit stared up at him with liquid eyes. Is everything fine, Seth? The man took in Job's appearance. Okay, thank you. So in yesterday, um, you make use of a few, what I'd call associative transitions. Um, the lights flicker out, just like when Job and Ify first meet. Um, there's a break then, and we move to that first encounter. Um, in your two later drafts, you keep some of these associations, but you don't always use them to transition from one scene to another, um, from past to present in particular. Can you speak to why you moved away from that kind of transition? Um, so in the initial draft, because of the structural device of the lights going out, kind of chopping the story up, I knew that I needed to find a way to get context into the story to help explain who they were. And so that's why there were so many moments where you go into the past. Um, but when I shifted in the newer drafts to um, 
expanding the scenes and putting a lot more in the direct present that became less necessary. And so the associations became more about developing the character more so than transitioning um, in and out of space and time. That makes total sense. Um, so just generalizing um, about some of the edits you made across versions, um, I'd say that in the first chapter of Mr. and Mrs. Doctor, um, there is more present tense action um, mm -hmm. as opposed to reported scene or flashback. Um, I mean, it is in the past tense um, in terms of how it's written, but um, we don't have as much of that flashback. So you, you aren't alternating as much between past and present. Um, so looking back at the excerpts you just read, um, you end up staying in the honeymoon suite um, and you, know, you have that man in his too tight suit knocked at the door. Um, why alternate between past and present -ness? Um, By staying with these two characters, I felt like I hadn't, I hadn't taken full advantage of the momentum that you have within a scene, right? An uninterrupted scene where things are just moving forward and, and the sort of continuous feel of being, you know, the kind of dream world that you're in when you're in a story. Mm -hmm. um, whenever you're chopping something up, you take your, your reader out of the story for a moment. They have to adjust and resettle and reorient themselves into a new scene um, and the context that accompanies, accompanies that. And so I felt that I wasn't fully exploiting all that I had um, within those scenes. And so just like sitting with the characters and the, and the funny thing is, once I sat with the characters, like I forced myself to just sit with them and allow things to unwind. Then a lot more crazy, you know, crazy hilarity ensues between the two of them because it's like, okay, well, what will happen next? You know, this just happened. You know, what's going to happen? I like really had to follow the, you know, the rabbit down the hole um, to kind of figure out, you know, who. And and in doing that, then I learned a lot more about the characters, right? and I and I think. That's something that you have to do. And I remember feeling like, what am I writing? <laughs> what is going on here? You know, because there's so many crazy things that go on, especially in the later drafts of it. Uh, but I also, also was like, I kept telling myself, just write it. And then you can always edit it out if it just goes too far. You know, I think about like, <laughs> um, there's like, you know, like with comics who just like tell dirty jokes or something, right? Like there's a point where you can't, you can't be too safe and too comfortable and sanitize things too much. You have to just go for it, right? And then like the revision is a great opportunity to like go back and say, okay, maybe I went a little too far with that. But I really tried to allow myself the room to allow, you know, to, kind of like to create enough space in the scenes for the story to breathe, essentially. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I mean, I, I feel like it's, it's a little bit of a technical question, but I mean, in a way, like what ends up happening is those causal relationships really mm -hmm. deepen, and it does get wild. Um, <laughs> it's so funny to see them like hitting each other and, you know, um, Job trying on Ethan's dress and just yeah. how, how he gets to that moment and how that changes draft to draft it is so much fun to encounter. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it has to depart from, like, I think really good stories, really good fiction has the elements of like truth in there, but then they have to depart in some ways. Um, it made me think a lot about when I was working on it. Um, oh, what's the story by the novel by Junpo Lahiri, um, The Namesake. And it's another novel about an immigrant couple who are in an arranged marriage. And um, I just felt like it, it's a beautiful book and I've taught it many times, but I also felt like it was clear that it was being written by the daughter and not by the parents. Because I thought like parents are young. At some point in their lives, they're young and they do really foolish things and they're not always proper and elegant and graceful or what, what have you, they're young people. Um, and so like, I wanted to like explore the messiness of their youth. Um, and so there's just like a lot of head butting in that scene and a lot of like crass things that going on between them because I wasn't interested in, um, wasn't interested in the other version, which is the parents that you grow up to know later on, you know, who are- mm -hmm. That's so astute, I think. Um, I, I guess what I hear you saying about um, the namesake and about Mr. and Mrs. Doctor is that, you know, in your own revisions, you were really thinking about the vantage point and um, what these characters didn't know about, you know, life and each other and, 
um, about how things would turn out. We tell stories in such a different way and we know the outcome of things when we're looking back, um, when our position or our perspective is, is um, in retrospective. Um, so in, in my last interview with um, Jonathan Blum, we spent some time thinking about revision as addition. The details writers add to deepen scenes and characters and get more on the page. Um, again, generalizing a little bit about edits you've made across these versions, um, I think it's probably fair to say that when it comes to direct present action, you've cut lines here and there, shaped and sharpened them, but on the whole, you've probably added more content than you've cut, filling out scenes, staying with particular moments longer, working in more details about secondary characters and deepening the causal responses. Um, let's look at the restaurant scene in particular, if you don't mind. You include that scene in Yesterday, but it's not nearly as fleshed out as it is in An Arranged Honeymoon and the first chapter of Mr. and Mrs. Doctor. Um, can you speak to some of the edits you made to that scene, especially details you added and why you thought to add them? And would you pay special attention to how, or to Ify's relationship with the boy who's begging, how her feelings toward him change as this scene plays out? Um, because I think that's important. Yeah, so in the initial draft, um, I believe they just go to the restaurant and they kind of just, you know, nothing really happens in that scene. You know, it's, they, they kind of sit there and they're chatting and there's a lot that just, uh, there's a lot of exposition. Um, and she notices things around her, but nothing really happens. And I think that um, in revising it, I really wanted to, I felt, you know, so I think one of the main differences between tension and external conflict is that you find a way to externalize what, you know, you have like the seeds of it there in the tension. And when you externalize it, you kind of bring it, um, you bring it out into the scene. And so she observes this boy who's in poverty and um, what I wanted her to, what, what I really wanted to happen in the, in the, in which I attempted to do in the second draft was um, for her to see herself in the boy. Um, and then for her to kind of, in seeing herself in the boy kind of react, um, you know, kind of this revulsion that she has. And then, and then it, so, there's, so there's an arc that, that comes into play there, right? And, you know, sort of a recognition and then a kind of like a recoiling at that recognition. But then the last piece of that is this kind of um, a moment where she takes ownership of who she will be. So the idea of being a big woman is something like Job has this notion of being a big man that he carries through the whole novel. And she has this notion of being a big woman. And that's something that she's constantly in conflict with throughout the entire novel. Um, and I think both of them are to some extent because being a big woman or being a big man in many ways means that they are, they have to be someone that's not themselves in a lot of ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so for Efi, there's a moment when she, her voice changes, her carriage changes, her posture, all of those things when she decides to take on the identity of a, a, a big woman. And that sort of comes through in, in how she responds to the child who's begging. I think that's perfectly put. And I mean, it, it feels like such an important scene to me because we constantly get Job um, playing the part of a big man. Um, but we don't mm -hmm. get that from Ify as much early on. Um, and, you know, her, her response to the boy, her realizing at first that you know, she could have too had this fate, mm -hmm. um, it makes perfect sense that she responds in the way that she does, that she doesn't want to look at him. She doesn't want to look at that reality and you know, pushes him away and then sees her own power once she mm -hmm. sees him hurting uh, mm -hmm. and steps into that. Um, it's another kind of delusion, you're so right to point mm -hmm. out, and another kind of play acting. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one that so perfectly encapsulates the kind of questions around authenticity and assimilation mm -hmm. and the kind of roles that we want to play that mm -hmm. um, this book becomes so concerned with. Yeah. Um, so, 
there are so many edits you made across these drafts that um, you know I find to be so perceptive. Even like the the smallest ones, um, so careful in terms of thinking out motivation and where this book is headed, um, and that really bring me closer and closer to your characters, um, how they think and how they act without breaking a spell that you cast. Um, I'm especially fond of how you treat Job's defensiveness in your drafts. He's constantly defensive. Um, and, you know, the moments that lead him to think about if he she should have been prettier, they're, they're usually out of, you know, a worry that he'll be rejected. Um, and, you know, I'm also so fond of how you interweave the stethoscope. Um, that's one of the major changes from your Kim and your Blue draft to, um, your book draft. Um, mm -hmm. So we talked earlier about associative transitions with the stethoscope. Um, you make use of a series of associations. Um, the pearls around Job's neck remind him um, first of the shell necklace that he failed to clasp, um, then of his first time wearing the stethoscope. That's how we get there. Um, he remembers his mother going from tears to laughter, seeing him in his dead brother's clothes, um, which are the time are too big for him. And he thinks maybe if his mother laughed at the ridiculousness of this outfit, that if he would laugh too, um, maybe she'd even hope like his father had. So th this is when um, Job is trying on it, Ethan's dress. Um, yeah. You lay out his logic pretty clearly. And you know, I think he does get something right here that this moment isn't the same as his memory. Um, you know, a child in his older brother's trousers that are too large um, isn't the same as a man in his fiance's dress. Mm -hmm. um, but he does understand that the ridiculousness can work, that ridiculousness in general can work to sort of deflate tension. Mm -hmm. And at this point, there is a lot of tension between Mm -hmm. um, so an arranged honeymoon, the story you published in the community here doesn't include the stethoscope. Um, I'm curious what led you to add it. Um, how do you think you managed so many associations in a relatively short space? And how do you balance the directness of making Job's thoughts clearer? Um, with the subtlety and mystery that I think, you know, also is in this scene. Um, what's left open-ended, what's spelled out, and why? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there was definitely a lot of push and pull in that area because I'm a firm believer as a writer that you shouldn't tell your readers what to think. Mm -hmm. That you kind of put all the cards on the table and let them put those pieces together. Um, but you have to do a lot of engineering right, to get them to see certain things. But, you, but again, you can't tell them what to think about those things. So, mm -hmm. so um, one thing, I, I love the way that you described it as filling a gap of logic because in the initial draft or in the initial version that appears in the Kenyan Review, it doesn't, the, the logic between this tension, this moment of tension between, uh, this moment of conflict between him and Ify and then the striptease, um, the cross-dress and script, uh, striptease scene the connection between those two pieces is like it's missing this piece in the middle, which is his motivation. Why is he doing it? What does he hope to get from out of it? And I think in the initial draft, I felt like it would, I felt like it was clear why he was doing it. Um, but I think, so I think it does, I think it is clear that there's a moment, there's an attempt at levity um, because it's just so, you know, it's so silly, right? It's not supposed to be sensual or erotic or anything like that. It's not an attempt at his, you know, attempt at his real identity. It's not, it's, it's attempt, it's really supposed to be silly, right? Um, but why does he decide to be silly? Why does he decide to have this moment of levity in that moment? And I wanted the root of that to be something very deep for him. And so that's sort of, that takes, you know, that going back to that scene from his childhood, um, Kind of like a primordial scene um, of him, um, you know. One of his one of his conflicts throughout the entire novel is that he is supposed to fit in his brother's shoes, and he doesn't feel 
you know, he really struggles with this. He doesn't really feel that he quite fits into those shoes, you know. Um, his brother, his older brother, went to go fight in the Nigerian Civil War and ended up dying. Um, and the older brother was supposed to be the inheritor of the family's name and all those things that come with being the first son, the opera um, and Igbo culture. And his brother dies, and then now he's the next son in line, and so it's his job. So this is like Prince William and Prince Harry, right? Now Prince Harry's got to step into the role, right? And um, one brother has been groomed his whole life for it and seems perfect for that role. And the other brother's kind of like not realize, you know, he just never, it's something that he had, he was forced to step into. Um, and so that moment of going back to that scene kind of sets up what I sort of imagine is one of the dramatic sort of um, dramatic themes that kind of runs through the entire, um, entire novel. Um, but like what goes on in that moment when he, when his father, it's in particular, I mean, he, he kind of looks at his mother in that scene, but it's really his, this communication with his father when his father is saying to him, you know, he's going through that box and trying on everything in the box. And the last thing that's left is a stethoscope. And now he's got to put it on. And that sort of cements, now you're going to take this role. Now you're going to wear the crown, right? So the stethoscope is really the crown that's being passed to him. Um, but tying that into this moment with Ify is like, it's also, it's all part of this, this life that's been planned for him, um, you know, in marrying Ify and all these things. And so that's kind of a moment that bridges those two things. One is the levity of that moment, the, this, the motivations towards it and the way this kind of thing can heal in some kind of way. But then the other thing is like a, like a, a furthering of this, or sort of like a concretizing of the fact that he has now taken on this, this particular role. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love um, I love the word engineering that you use in particular in that, um, you know, that levity does absolutely come through in earlier drafts. And he's clearly playing and, um, you know, wearing, wearing his fiance's dress and dancing around in the way he does. <laughs> You know, isn't sexy in a traditional way. Right. <laughs> it's clown yeah. and playful and very jovial. Yeah. Um, but I, I think you know, you adding what you do there and kind of letting us see without over explaining just how he gets to that place and you slow that scene down in a way that's really, really beautiful and you know, kind of leap from from this necklace that spilled all over the floor like the peanuts mm -hmm. um, earlier to this necklace that he's bought, Yifi, um, that reminds her of her father in some ways, um, you know, to this stethoscope. Um, the amount of leaps is, is really astounding because it doesn't feel too much. It feels like this is exactly how he would get to this weird dance he does. <laughs> So, you know, you engineered perfectly, I think. Um, so for all the changes that you make across these drafts, um, a lot of some of it really does stay the same, um, or, you know, at least move around some. Um, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that um, the scaffolding was already there in yesterday. Um, and that the content that doesn't get used in this, that chapter sometimes, you know, shifts mm -hmm. the chapters up. Um, so what didn't change across these versions and why not? Um, um, what didn't change? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think what didn't change was essential, um, the central questions driving that initial meeting. Like, you know, they have this job to do and then but then there are all these obstacles to that, right? That sort of central thing. Um, and the obstacles to that are very revealing, right? So their job is to copulate and to, you know, to you know, make this marriage real, right? And, um, but then there are so many obstacles to it. And the obstacles to it are those things that then form them as people and as potentially as a couple because they think their job is to consummate the marriage, but their job is actually to get to know each other and to share some tenderness. But they don't learn that right away. That's what they sort of figure out once they get, once they stop, um, they're performing, right? But they're performing in a very different way by the end of the, by the end of that first chapter. 
Yeah, I think um, you show us so many of the different ways that they're performing and deleting themselves. And I mean, I guess to go back to some of what you were saying earlier too about um, water and generators, um, you know, I think some, some of what, what ends up leaving um, this chapter ends up being a like backstory that interferes with like that, that relating to each other that they're figuring out. And mm -hmm. um, in terms of the generator stuff too, um, it, it very much stays, but that's one instance where you actually end up like kind of summarizing it a little more like working with exposition as opposed to seeing mm -hmm. increases anyway. So uh, thank you, Julie, so much for um, sharing all these insights with us. And um, I guess my final question is, um, where can we find your work and where can listeners purchase a copy of Mr. and Mrs. Stock? <laughs> Um, so Mr. and Mrs. Doctor is pretty much available everywhere. So first I should mention Coffee House Press. You can find it on their website. Mm -hmm. It's also available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble's websites. Many, so pretty much everywhere you can see it. Um, and it's in different forms too. So format, so you can get it as an um, ebook if you prefer. There's an audible version also. It's really fun to listen to. Actually, my mom, my mom loves the Audible version, so she, so everybody, so there's a version for everyone. And then um, I have like shorter works and excerpts, which you can actually find on my website, um, www.julieromania.com. And you can be able to see like all of my um, links um, for different places where, where the shorter stories or different types of excerpts are linked. I also do critical writing too. And so there's some links for that as well. Okay, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the audible version because I, I both read it and listened to it and I sometimes struggle to listen to books but the audible version of your book is really really incredible I find it's, uh, the performance is great. Yeah you know I, that was my first time with that kind of experience and it's really fascinating to like um, just to see the work that goes into the narrator like developing the characters and creating the voices around it and developing their arcs and, and, how, and how all that comes out in the performance. So that was really a fascinating experience. To, and and I, now I actually, after that, I became more of a consumer of, um, of, e, uh, of uh, audible versions too. So there's some really good, I really love Trevor Noah's um, uh, Born a Crime. I really love his, his reading of his, and there's a really fantastic reading of Invisible Man with, um, well, I'm forgetting the guy's name, but um, he's he was the father on Scandal, Eli Pope. So <laughs> it was really, really fantastic reading. Um, well, th thanks for sharing all that. And thank you, Julie, again, for um, your thoughtfulness here and for this work. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed this uh, you know, walk down memory lane. <laughs>